Okay, so uh, before we start on uh, what a model portfolio should look like, I'd just like to clarify two things because the gentleman uh, asked me a que two questions which were good and I think I should share them with you all. Um, one of the questions which he asks, with, which everyone asks, is at this point, okay, you have the accumulator, share class and the distributor share class. The price of the, the fund fell, okay? And uh, his question was, but now, if I buy the accumulator, if I buy the distributor at this price, don't I get more units in the fund? When the answer is yes, you get more units because the price is lower, but you don't have to think of it that way. Think of it at that point, okay? You're going to invest 10,000 euro, okay? From this point to this point, and from this point to this point, the fund is up 6%. So on 10,000 euro, you're up 6% on the accumulator and the distributor. It's irrelevant that you have more units. And that's the problem which a lot of people look at. They look at how much units they have, not at the value of their portfolio. You have to see the value of, value of your portfolio at the beginning and the, at the end, okay? Irrelevant how much units you have, the value of the portfolio will increase by exactly the same amount. The benefit of this is that it will increase even further because you don't have the 15% tax and uh, so, so actually, the accumulator would, would perform even better, okay? Uh, we'll take the questions after, I'm just, these are just some questions that I, I got. And just one other thing I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like to mention about the, about the fund. Um, he told me, but if I need the money the next day, can I get the money out of the fund and, and do this? And the answer is yes. He told me, because I have some bonds and I come to sell and and uh, I wouldn't be able to sell immediately. Now, um, the difference between some bonds which trade, for example, 200 plus one or, or whatnot, you need to create a batch in order to be able to, to, sell, to, sell, to sell these bonds. Um, when it comes to a fund, you have no problem whatsoever. This is, you go in by yourself, okay? And when you come to, to, to sell your shares, um, the fund administrator obviously will, will, will take care of that so you can sell instantaneously okay? if it's a daily fund on, on the next day. So there isn't a problem with, with the need to be, to be selling out, to, to be selling and, and getting your, your, your proceeds, okay? When it comes to, to a fund. Okay, so we spoke about uh, what a fund is. Um, I hope that in the first half of the presentation uh, you feel more confident now that uh, a lot of uh, questions which you might have had um, have been answered and that uh, yes, the fund managers are regulated, yes, the fund managers can do what they want, and yes, um, the fund managers work in the best interest of shareholders, and yes, there are all the documents out there available, and yes, they are simple to understand and, and, and read. So really and truly um, not knowing what, what a fund is all about um, is more uh, a lack of uh, going out there and getting these informations. Um, one other thing, when we're talking about the CC, equity, uh, equity, CC funds, um, when we're talking about the kids and, 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 and fact sheets, they're all available on our website. Um, but for all other funds, um, if you just put in the, the ISIN, okay, or, or the ticker and write a fact sheet or whatever, they will come up. If you go on UBS website, okay, and you put in the, the ISIN and ticker, the, the, the documents will come up. Okay, so these are all available. Again, one other thing I'd like to stress is that when I spoke about these things like the kid, where you get this information, because um, uses funds are, are regulated, because um, it's a level playing field across all um, European countries, okay, they are the same for all, okay? Just the name changes, where if you're buying a, a hedge fund in the US, this data you, you won't get, okay? Or, Okay, building a model portfolio, starting from scratch. Now, okay, we, we spoke about what a fund is, let's start building a portfolio. And like any other portfolio, okay, whether it's an equity portfolio, whether it's a bond portfolio, whether you're going directly, you need to be asking yourself the same questions. Okay, it's no dif there's no difference between uh, a fund portfolio or an individual asset portfolio. Okay, the questions you need to ask yourself have to be the same. And the first thing you need to ask yourself, okay, is what type of return do I expect from my portfolio? What type of time horizon do I expect from my portfolio? Okay, what type of risks am I willing to take in my portfolio? And it's good to be asking yourself these questions because people 
don't ask these questions and they put their money in, 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 a, in, in a fund, okay, and that fund might not meet their needs requirement. Do I need a distribution from the fund, for example? Because although I told you that it makes even more sense to be buying an accumulator than a distributor, people do need income from their portfolio, okay? If you're a pensioner or, or you're living off the returns from your portfolio, okay, you need income coming in. And in that case, you'll be looking at, at a distributor. So there are different share classes and you have to make sure you're buying the right share class. So it's not just the fund, but the share class matches what you need. Okay, and these are all the questions you need to, to, to be asking yourself. And by asking yourself these questions, you'll be able to make a better, more informed decision. Okay, now again, look at your personal portfolio and look at the way you are allocated in your portfolio. A rule of thumb says that if you're a 20 year old um, student, you should be invested 80% in equities, 20% of bonds. If you're, eight year old, if, if you're a 20 year old, if you're 80 year old, you should be 20% equity, 80% bond. But that's just a rule of thumb because everyone's case is different. Okay, if you're 80 year old, once I met a client who's 80 year old, had, had a portfolio and said, the income from this portfolio, I'm not even going to touch. I, I don't even need it. Okay, that's different. I mean, everyone's a different, different case. Okay, so not everyone's the same. But rule of thumb, if, my, if I'm 20 and I'm 100% invested in MGSs, then there's something very wrong in my portfolio. Okay, and <laughs> when I talk about these, I'm talking about equities and bonds. Again, we move into the fund business, okay? Um, if I'm saying I'm 20 and I need 80% in equities, then when I look at the fund list, okay, my eyes should go down on, on, the, on the equity portion, okay? Because I need to, to pick out from, from the equity portion, which, which funds will, should do well. Okay, once I, uh, I put down what I need out of my portfolio, what return I expect, what risk I expect, okay, then you start by yourself saying, look, there are these three strategies, okay? Now, like I said, we're building this portfolio, okay? If you don't even want to go through this process because it's, uh, it's work which needs to be done. There is a product which actually does this work for you. Okay, but I'll speak about that later. But let's say you want to do this by yourself because you want to participate in the markets, you want to feel part of the market, okay, but you want someone to help you out doing, doing so, okay, the fund manager is helping you out doing this, but you still want to feel you're active in the market. Okay, so you start off by deciding whether you want income, balance or dynamic. There's just three names I put down there, you can call them whatever you want, um, but it's just telling you, Okay, the income portfolio is highly skewed towards bonds, obviously because you want income, and 25% exposure to equity. 50-50 for a balanced portfolio, and 25-75 for a dynamic, okay, aggressive um, portfolio. I don't like using the word aggressive because it's not the right word to be using, um, but uh, we can use the word dynamic, which I think is more appropriate. Okay, <laughs> something else you need to, okay, so we're going to start off, um, everyone chooses which, which uh, portfolio he fits in. From time to time, the markets will move, okay, and these allocations will not, dis will not remain the same. Now, I told you when you invest, you invest for a five-year period, okay, but during even one year, okay, you can be a situation, you're in a best portfolio, and because the equity markets are doing pretty well, Okay, the equity parts go up to 75% because of capital appreciation, <coughs> and the bonds, for example, went down to 25. In that case, you would need to rebalance the portfolio. That means sell out of equities and buy some bonds. You tell me, but why on earth are you telling me to do that? Because the equity market is doing well. So you start to get excited and you say, look, let me stay in equities. No, because you have to be disciplined and say, look, I started off, over here saying that I need, I need a balanced portfolio because of XXX, whatever is ha happening in my life, okay, and I need this return. Because then you can easily lose, lose focus of what you want out of your portfolio because you get carried away with the way markets are, are working, okay? So periodically, okay, ideally on a quarterly basis or semi-annual basis or um, look at your portfolio and see if the allocation remains the same. 
Okay? And if it didn't, you need to readjust positions. Okay? So that's the next thing you need to do. Now, you need to start implementing your strategy. And we started off with an income strategy where we're saying we're 25% invested in equities and 75% and, uh, in bonds. Now, what I did was, and like you have in your packs, there are our CC um, bond list, uh, CC fund list, and our UBS list, okay? And I went in and I got, um, I created a portfolio with a 25-75% allocation, okay? And I saw, had I been invested in these funds over the last five years, what my performance would be, okay? And the total return would, would include, okay, the distributions made by the fund. Okay, where I have distributed everything over there, it means these funds paid me, a, paid me an interest, okay? Um, where I have an accumulator, it means that if the, the fund received any income, it didn't distribute it to its shareholders, okay? But it's kept on reinvesting, okay? And I, I allocated, that's the initial, when we started five years ago, okay? Have you been invested with those allocations? Now, those allocations weren't rebalanced, Okay, I, 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 kept it, I kept things simple. I didn't go through the rebalancing stage, I, I, I said over there, obviously. But I said, if, uh, just uh, a simple calculation, had I kept them for five years, what would my performance be? Okay? And those are, are the returns you have seen in your portfolio. And the five-year return on this portfolio would have given you a 45% capital appreciation in this, in this uh, low-risk portfolio. Great performance for a row low risk portfolio. Um, your performance would have been even higher than that. Why? Because over five years, if you look at the performance of the USD, okay, we saw a strong rebound in the value of the dollar against the euro. And since here you would have had exposure to USD, you would have made even more money. Okay, but I, I didn't incorporate it in there. That's not the point. The point is to show you that uh, these, per these funds have performed well over a five year period, so have a good track record. Okay, so, uh, they have done well. Now you could have told me you, you chose these, maybe you, you chose the best performing from the best performing in the fund. Okay, you can do this exercise yourself. The funds are there. I mean, you can, these, uh, these are the first. I just create, I just picked up five, um, picked up some, some funds which are there. Okay, I tried to balance it, um, but I didn't say choosing which funds to get the highest return I, I could be getting. Um, could be you get a much higher return if you do the same exercise yourself. Um, using, the, using different funds in the list, okay? But my first uh, try and, and, and I got the, this return, okay? Um, just to show you if we're talking about the high yield, um, I put down the Kalamata Kushkiri fund, I put down a UBS fund, some shoulder funds and the UBS. I, I, I also diversified amongst the, the, the fund managers, okay? When it comes to emerging markets, I put down a balanced fund, in actual fact, when I, I talked about the balance fund, I said there are bonds and equities. But just to be prudent, I took it as, as though that 5% was an equity exposure, okay, just for prudence sake. So I added, it to the, I added that to the equities, so my 75%, 25% exposure came out as follows. 45% for a low risk portfolio um, is, is, a, is an excellent return. Or even without uh, l looking at this, because um, without having taken, taken this. If you think of what happened, okay, to, to investment grade, if you look at what happened to high yield and what happened to the equity markets over the last five years, okay, um, that figure makes, my, makes sense. Okay, 75% 25% exposure, 4 to 5% return is, is, uh, ties in. Moving on, for someone who, want, who wanted more risk. Okay, so now what we're going to see is we're going to see less bonds and more balanced and more equities. Okay, because we're going to a balanced approach now. Okay, and in this case, had you invested in, in these names, okay, as you can see, UBS, I put some JP Morgan, Franklin Templeton. Um, again, all funds from our list, okay, you would have got over five years a return of, of uh, 48%. Plus, it would have been higher, like I said before, had you included the, the currency movement. 
And last but not least, obviously, for those who wanted a dynamic portfolio, for those that could take uh, an equity portfolio um, and wanted to invest in funds, um, we included the 25% in high yield, um, again, more in equities and compared to the balance and, and more in, in balance. And uh, it would have given you a 60% expo, a 60% return in, uh, in, uh, in an, an aggressive portfolio. Again, all of, the, all of this ties in with, with what has been happening in the market and all of this uh, makes sense. And again, from this point forward, where do, where do we see the markets going? Okay, so in the market outlook, I will talk about our view on the markets and how a portfolio should be positioned. Okay, and through that, you would be able to, once we go to the list, pick out those, those sectors, pick out those asset classes which we think should be outperforming. And uh, again, if you see the performance of uh, the income balance and the dynamic over a five-year period, that was a great return. Okay, so now others may, might say, but there were other asset classes over five years which have given a much better performance, for example. But one, okay, if you're diversified in, in the equity markets, if you're di diversified in the bond market, okay, you, no one has a crystal ball to say exactly by how much, okay, people do get a gauge of where they think the markets are going or which asset class should outperform another asset class, but by exactly how much, we do not know. But then again, even just by saying, look, over a five year period I made 60%, okay, maybe having invested directly in, in the equity market, I would have made a bit more. But I knew that there was a manager there taking care of my portfolio. 60% over five years, who's going to complain about that? Okay, even more so if you're taking a, a much less risky portfolio and getting a 45% return over five years. I think going, obviously moving forward the next five years, this is, uh, you can forget about getting 45% in a low risk portfolio obviously because interest rates are where they are today, but the dynamic portfolio and the balanced portfolio still have room to grow. And I believe that this is the, these are the two um, portfolios that people need to be focusing on, okay? <coughs> Just to, for you to understand, um, a lot of people have invested in MGSs over, over, over many years, okay? People have made a lot of money and people have made money and many don't even know how they have made this money. Um, but the reason was we were in a situation, okay, where economic growth wasn't as, as good as, as we expected, okay, we were going through, through some tough times and MGSs, which are safe havens, would do well, okay? So we have the, the bond market doing well. We come at a point now, okay, that uh, yields are very low, prices are very high, and data is, is coming out positive. So we already started to see a correction when we talk about, uh, about MGSs. Um, if we, even to, to, tell you, um, to compare MGSs to another, to another sovereign, if you look at the 10-year German bond, in the 1990s, okay, you'd at, at one point you'd be earning 8% on a risk-free or close to risk-free asset, okay? If you look at the 10-year German bond, okay? Today, you get 0% on that. Okay, that would, have, again, I mean, 8% <coughs> in the 90s, today 0%, a huge rally in, in this asset class, okay? And now we're starting to see economies recover. Why? Because if economies are, are doing poorly, people move into safe havens, okay? But once we see a recovery in the economy, we start seeing a shift into riskier, riskier asset classes, okay, which are dependent on the performance of economies, Okay, and we start to see those asset classes. It's the time of those asset classes to do well. Okay, and, uh, and again, to conclude on this slide, I truly believe that the balance and the dynamic portfolios are the ones which will continue generating this positive return for clients in years to come. So, how do we select our funds? I said we do have a CC, a, a CC fund list and we do have a UBS list. How do we select these funds in the list? Okay. And there is a process which we adopt in order to select these, these funds. One is that all the funds in the list have to be used. Okay, so in, in, the, in all of those thousands of funds that uh, Alex was talking about, okay, we already 
move a lot of funds out of the, of, of the selection process because they have to be used. Okay, we want to make sure that it's a level, a level playing field for all the managers and we want to make sure that we understand how these managers operate. Why? Because we are users managers ourselves. So we know exactly what, what uh, their limitations are, okay, how they operate, and we are comfortable with that. <coughs> we want the funds to be open-ended. I already explained the difference between open-ended funds and closed-ended funds. We want funds to be open-ended, that is, that if you come to redeem your shares or if you come to buy shares, okay, new, new shares are issued if you, you're buying new, new shares, okay, and uh, they're not traded on an exchange. Okay, the asset classes we will focus on are equities, bonds, okay, and, and the location of the two, which in that case would be a balanced fund, um, two asset classes which we believe in, which we know, okay, and we need a minimum five-year track record. Why? Because if there, there is a five-year track record, okay, we can see consistency in results. If we see a portfolio that one year is up 20%, the next year is up down 30, the next year is up five, the next year is down 15, okay, um, it doesn't give me confidence that the fund manager is, uh, is moving um, in a strategy that uh, creates um, comfort for, for an investor to be invested in. Okay, so we want, to see, we want to see stability. Sometimes it's better underperforming the index, but having stability rather than having large shifts in a portfolio. Okay, the currencies we focus on are euro, dollar, and sterling, and the funds in this list okay, and need to be larger than 10 to 100 million, okay? And obviously, country, funds available to investors in Western Europe, the uses funds are going to be available, okay? So, again, we started off with a huge area of funds, and once we start plugging in these criteria, the number <coughs> decreases, decreases, and decreases. Okay, so those are the, they need to at least tick all of these boxes before we start the selection process. Okay, then how do we go into further deciding which out of all these funds should we be looking at? Okay, then we look at the five-year annualized total return. Okay, so when we talk about five-year annualized, and you look at this figure, you're not going to see a figure which is bombastic. Why? Because it's not a five-year performance. It's five years divided, put simply, over, over each year. Okay, so how much would you have got each year? if you had kept it for five years, okay? Again, that won't be, so if you see a five-year figure which is 10%, it doesn't mean over fi five-year annualized, it doesn't mean it gave you 10% if you held it for the whole five years, okay? It's, it's an average year on year, okay? Three-year annualized, one-year annualized. So we look at those, those three data, why? Because one year could be an amazing performance, but is that amazing performance carried out year on year, okay? Does the fund do well even in a bad year? Or in a bad year, does the fund protect the assets of, of, of the client? Okay, so we don't just look at one year. We look at, at, at other years also. Okay, the fund strategy, the industry group, okay? Anyway, the SRI, and uh, we look at all those, okay? And then we give weightings, okay? Where do we give the largest weighting? We'll give the largest weighting to volatility, okay? We don't want large volatility in, in the funds. We want five year performance. Okay, we give high weighting there. Why? We give higher weighting to five years than one year. Because like I said, five years gives stability, gives stability and gives us a better picture of whether this, this fund manager is really performing. Look, every year he's giving us what, what, what uh, he should be giving us. Okay, and we look at the sharp ratio. That's excess returns per unit of risk. Okay? So again, we get all this data. Okay? It's put into a model. And, and finally, after going through all this, this process, we, we get our list of what we believe are the best performing funds in, in the list. Okay, obviously based on our model. And this is what the fund list looks like. And the fund list is in your pack, okay, and I'll go through them so you'll be able to understand um, the different he headings that are available and how you come to choose the funds you want. In the first column, you see the title at, at the top, which is, which is important and tells you the, sec the, the type of asset class we're looking at. So here we're talking about investment grade accumulators. Okay, so this, these are investment grade bonds, okay, but they're accumulators, which means they're not going to pay you out 
a distribution. Okay, so if you want income coming from, from, from your f bond fund, okay, you don't need to be looking at this, okay? You need to be looking at the other one, which is an investment grade distributor, okay? So you go an investment grade distributor, and if you see in this column, which is type, okay, it's telling you it's a distributor. Moving down, high yield distributors, okay? High yield bond funds that are distributing, okay? Um, income to shareholders. Then there are high, high yield accumulators, okay, not distributing, emerging market funds, um, asset allocators, distributors, and accumulators and, and equity, okay? In this column, again, I'm just repeating what is the distributor accumulator, and on this date, it tells you the next distribution date, okay? So on that date, you should be expecting, okay, that uh, somewhere close to that date you'll be receiving, uh, because on that date the, the fund pays the, the, the interest, okay? And you'll be, you'll, the dividend, you'll be expecting to receive it. And on this other date, on this other column, which is also important, it's telling you how many times a year does the fund pay out, pay out to its shareholders, okay? And uh, for example, this one pays out monthly, and the others pay, pay, out, pay out, and will end quarterly. Now, obviously, if you don't need a monthly return, a monthly income, Okay, it doesn't pay to go for a monthly, why? Because there, there is the tax and the charges for, for receiving a, a check every month. But if, again, if you live just on your portfolio, then that, would make sen that might make sense for you. But if you don't need that income coming in all the time, then it makes sense to go for something annually or quarterly. Okay? In the other column, the distribution yield. Okay, what yield we're expecting it to, to be distributing. Okay? And... Uh, this is the performance of the fund, okay, year to date. Now, again, looking at this performance, everything ma makes a lot of sense. Why? Year to date, uh, we've squeezed a lot out of investment grade, okay, so there's, there's a limit how much these can, you can squeeze out of this asset class from this point forward, okay? If you look at uh, going, going down here, then in the higher distrib distributors, now this one, when we're talking about uh, year to date, that includes Okay, even the distributions. And it goes, it goes on for, for the other, for the other um, funds. Then we go on to the one year, three year, and five year annualized returns. Okay, I spoke about annualized and I explained okay, that annualized does not mean that over five years this, this uh, fund gave you 4%. It means that on average, every year you got uh, that kind of return. Okay? And here we have the size of the fund, okay, and the price of the fund at the moment. Okay, so in just one sheet, okay, like I, like I said, to summarize, in, in this, which is top rated euro fund, okay, um, there's also the dollar one in, in the pack. These are being, being circulated every Tuesday, I believe, uh, if your email is, is uh, in our database, um, an email is sent out with these lists. If your email is not in our database, please give us your email so we can send them to you, and you have a lot of information there, okay? Again, like I said before, just because all these are here, it doesn't mean this strategy is the right strategy to buying at this point in time. Okay, so and then, um, you need to go deeper in, into the subject and understand which strategies, okay? Which, which strategies here will uh, give you the return you require in order for your portfolio to generate uh, further returns going forward. And like I said in the beginning, I think at this point going forward, we think that the, the balance and the dynamic, again, a mixture, there is a mixture of bonds also in that, okay, but a lower mixture of bonds in, in this portfolio um, will generate returns going forward, okay? When we talk about investment grade, the, these two up here, um, we don't uh, expect that these two will generate uh, much returns going forward. Why? Because we have squeezed everything out of them. And the same is done for the UBS fund list. Okay, so again, uh, a process is, uh, we go through a, a whole process of which funds to, to pick. Okay, the same process is done for this separate list. Okay, again, great funds put down here, funds which we think will, will do well going forward. Again, it's important that this strategy but ties in with what we think um, should, should do well. Now, some people may ask, so what, why do you put down, for example, investment grade uh, accumulator and distributors there if you're saying at this point in time, don't buy investment grade? Number one, 
um, things change over time, okay? So at this point in time, those are not, not the funds we, we plan on buying. But things change and uh, there will come a time, okay, because uh, markets trade in cycles, that it could be that uh, we would be looking at those names again. And also, by tracking them and knowing their performance, okay, the list will always have those, those sub, uh, subheadings, okay, those, those, those different classes. And uh, with those, you'd be able to, to pick up which uh, you think will, will do well going forward. Okay, and those are the subheadings I mentioned before. I don't need to go into detail again, um, but they're in this slide and, and you'd be able to, to refer to them. Okay, so that, that would, would be a portfolio um, that you created by yourself by investing in, in funds, okay? And like I said, a portfolio needs to be rebalanced and it needs to be monitored um, periodically. But then for some people, maybe this still is uh, too much to do. Maybe you don't want to get involved in, in the markets and, and how, how things are going on, okay? Because the, the beauty of this is that although um, you're investing in funds, you still are taking the most important decision, which is in which way are the markets going, okay? And that will determine the, the performance of the fund. But if uh, still that is a bit um, too much for you to take on, then we offer the service of managed fund portfolios, okay? And in that case, what you have to do, okay? Again, like uh, we started at, at step two, you choose the income balance or the equity, okay? You choose the income balance or the dynamic. You choose which, which, uh, which one you feel um, you need for your portfolio, okay? And then which funds we buy is at the discretion of the manager, okay? So Kalamat Koshkiri will, will decide which funds are best to, to buy for that strategy for, for, for the individual wanting to, to opt for it, okay? As well, this is, a, this is a, an, a product that um, just launched for its clients, okay? And so it's uh, something which uh, we will be, our advisors will, will be offering to, to their clients um, in, in the weeks ahead. Okay, what is the CC savings plan? Now, again, um, these are things we offer, these are products we offer for our clients, okay? Which uh, want to save on, on a periodic basis, okay? Now again, we're moving on to smaller amounts, okay? But want to, continuous, want to continuously invest um, in this product, okay? And, and build up a portfolio gradually, okay? So there are a lot of benefits of being invested in this. Again, you have to choose the strategy you'd like to be invested in, which is over here, okay? But this time, instead of uh, like a managed fund portfolio, you, you offer X amount, okay, and then you can top it up when you want to top it up. This is, a, this is an exercise where, okay, you, you start uh, feeding in um, slowly, slowly. And this would apply, for example, to students who won't be able to start off with a managed portfolio of an X amount, okay, but have smaller amounts to be investing in. And uh, this is, again, trying to make your life easier, okay, trying to offer a service where um, it, uh, caters for your needs, okay? And caters for everyone from different backgrounds and different portfolios, okay? Doesn't mean you have to have a huge amount of cash to be able to invest, okay? We try to cater for everyone's needs and, and different uh, portfolios. Then there is what is known as the discretionary portfolio management, okay? This is for portfolios of a large size, okay? Who are given um, personal attention um, and the, the portfolio is managed directly by, by the manager, okay? So in this case, um, for a large portfolio, the investment manager actually buys individual names and bonds, okay? It's not, it doesn't invest in funds, okay? There is a, a management fee for this, um, and one-to-one uh, -one meetings and, uh, and personal fact sheets, if you want to put it that way, for, it's like creating a fund just for one person, okay? Obviously, these are portfolios of, large, of a large size, um, and uh, we're, give, we're, we're giving uh, this service 
for these clients. But then again, like I said before, you don't have to have half a million portfolio to be given a good service. Why? Because there is the fund business, okay? There's the MFPs, the managed fund portfolio business. There is the, there is the, the fund list, okay? We're helping you out in every single way, okay? So from 10,000 euro, whether it's 10,000 euro, whether it's 10 million euro, okay? Um, we, have, we have something for everyone, okay? And everyone has given importance. So uh, basically from my end, um, we've covered uh, what needed to be covered when it comes to, to individual funds, the mechanics of funds, um, how to build your own portfolio, and our outlook on the market. Um, at this point, we can take uh, any questions you may have on the presentation or anything else. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Do you have any indications on the on the uh, on the uh, future future price of oil? Because at the end of the day, everything comes down to energy. Or yes, it comes down to energy. I do. In fact, I had a slide on, on oil, but I didn't want to go into too much detail. Um, the price of oil at the moment around the 43 level is uh, we can't say is not looking attractive. Um, in fact, not just looking at the crude oil by itself, but also looking at companies in the industry like Total, um, which is trading on a dividend yield of around 6% and an earnings yield of around 10% is very attractive. Um, but uh, what worries us is that things have changed. Um, we have Libya, which, which is pumping oil at the highest rate it has been pumping uh, for the last five years. Uh, we have the US, which is pumping much more than it used to, obviously. and. Uh, we have uh, supply which, which, has, which has increased. Having said that, there are talks that OPEC should con would uh, come up with further cuts. Um, whether this will happen or not, or how it will happen, um, we'll still have to see. But if you see what Adrenas are saying uh, on the oil market, um, they still see a, a higher oil price from, from this point forward. So looking at the market at this point in time wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, in fact, if we talk about uh, our, own, our own decisions and decisions we take, if you look at the equity fund just this week, um, we started debating uh, the oil market and we started dip dipping in slowly um, by taking a position. Something which is very important though to understand is what's happening to oil now and what happened to oil in the beginning of last year. Last year we had a situation where markets were worried of a slowdown in, in China and, and economic growth. So the price of oil was going down, not because there was oversupply, but because there was worried of uh, demand slowing down because global growth was, was expected to slow down. None of this happened. In fact, global growth continued to grow up. Go up. What we're seeing now is a situation where supply is increasing, not because demand is falling, but because more players are coming onto the market. So even understanding that make, makes a difference. But overall, at this level, uh, oil starts to, look, starts to look interesting, especially individual companies which give extremely interesting dividend yields. On all the fund lists, you have the SRRI listed, except for the UBS. Why is that? Um, no particular reason. I'll, uh, I'll check with uh, the people that have actually created the list, but uh, it's something we can include in the list. It's okay. not an issue. Just like I've showed you, the, the kit that I've, I've actually showed you was from UBS itself, so um, they're available for all funds. Uh, as you've seen, the markets have been bullish for quite some time now. Yes. Many observers are saying that a uh, correction is coming. They've been saying this for months. What is your advice? Do we think we should jump in now or wait? I think... Uh, Number one, you have to be careful when you say a correction is coming because, I mean, we're already halfway through the year. If you had sold, put it, look at it differently um, at the beginning of the year and coming from a year which was difficult last year, every time you see the market rally, you think a correction is going to come. Undoubtedly because we've been through a very difficult year last year, so we expect it to happen. Um, had you sold when you, when you thought a correction was coming, um, you would have lost a lot of money. Why? Because the market kept on going up. Um, 
Moving forward, I think that uh, the equity markets, particularly in Europe, will continue to, to do well. One, because data continues to be supportive. Two, um, because we're seeing, we're seeing companies continue to, to report positive results. We have earnings season coming out now, and we expect it to be a good one. Um, three, because the bond market is what it is. I mean, investment grade is not giving you anything anymore. Um, if you look at the last, for example, MGSs which were issued, were around 2% level. If you go back uh, a year, they were giving 3%. Five years back, the government was giving you over 5%. So, I mean, this is the reality of today. So if you want return, you need to get return from somewhere, and this is an asset class which is giving it to you. Yes, valuations are not as attractive as they were at the beginning of this year, but with the positive data coming out, um, companies should continue to, to outperform. And like I was telling the gentleman, I mean, with uh, the reduction in oil price and uh, total yielding 6%, I mean, these companies, okay, start to start looking even more attractive. So it depends on which sectors we, we think will outperform going forward and moving your allocation. It's not just when we talk about equities, just by equities. It means sectors within the equity space, which should continue outperforming. Um, to, to give you some ideas, like the European construction is one. Um, European banks is something worth looking into. Why? Because we expect rates to start rising sooner than later in Europe, and banks should do well. Um, the European auto industry, we expect to continue doing well. Um, and, but a smaller allocation than the three industries I just spoke to, uh, the oil sector slowly start looking at because at these levels, it starts to look very interesting. Just one thing, uh, you all have a questionnaire in your, in your pack. If you can fill it up, please. Thank you. Um, I think you mentioned something about beta being related to risk. Now, is beta a constant for any fund or even an equity, or does it vary over time? And what about the relationship between beta and volatility, please? Okay, so uh, no, beta changes over time depending on the, the, the way the, the market is, uh, is being positioned. So if we're going through, uh, if the sector in particular is going through a tough time, obviously it, it, will, it will affect the beta of the company. Beta is uh, associated to risk. So if we're talking about the auto industry, or if we're talking about banks, for example, uh, the beta of this sector will be much higher than if we're talking about, for example, the telecommunications, com the telecommunications industry. Okay, so there, just by looking at beta, you'd be able to gauge whether you're taking on a, a, a stock which is riskier than the market in general. Now, the market in general does include these stocks also, but includes defensives and, uh, and all, all types of stocks. How was beta calculated as such? It, uh, you look at the past performance uh, of, of the index and uh, it's, it's a regression analysis. So it take, it wor it's worked on, on performance of, of the past to see how performance has performed, how, how it has performed. When you mentioned ICITS rules, you said there can't be 30, more than 35% to any member state. 30, more, not more than 35%. That's for sovereign bonds, but... I see. That means European member states, you mean? So, for example, Germany, you have a 35% exposure to, to the German bond. Yes, but that doesn't mean that's European member states? Or yes, European. So you can't, inv they won't be investing in, in, the U in the US? No, they that limit f is for U European member states. Oh, I see. Okay, and um, when you say you gave the example of 100,000 euros in the fund, mm -hmm. Just for to have an idea, how many, company, how, how many company, companies will you be invested in? Those 100,000, will they be invested in about 50 companies, 100 companies? No, it will be invested in much more companies because what you have to see is each, each fund you're investing in, how much companies they're investing in there because each fund yeah. has an amount of cost into it. So, so you might have 200 companies. Exactly. And when you say... Uh, you can't be emotional, and the fund manager isn't emotional. Exactly. What happens? You have a fund, we have a, an equity, which rises to 40%, and then within months, it goes down to minus 
when do you decide to sell that equity? No, because what I mean, mean by that is that uh, a lot of people have a portfolio, okay? Have some constituents in the portfolio which are doing poorly, okay? And the outlook of that industry, take for example oil, um, moving back to last year, okay? Um, even further back, at one point it was uh, $120 a barrel, okay? And it started falling and falling. And uh, there were times when people at 100 were averaging down, at 90 averaging down, at 80 averaging down, okay? They just can't say, they can't let go of it because they, they keep on fearing that they made a mistake, but they want to get their money back. Yeah. And they keep chasing a, a, fo uh, a falling knife, okay? Um, if, and uh, during the, the oil crisis, we were never exposed to oil because we didn't uh, believe in it. Um, the problem is with the individual, the individual keeps on holding on to it most of the time because he doesn't want to cash in on a loss, okay? Uh, whereas an investment manager doesn't have feelings towards an asset and if he feels it's time to get out, even if there's a loss, he gets out of it. Obviously, the cash will be reinvested in something where he believes will, will outperform. My, my comment there was that they look at, uh, for example, JP Morgan coming out with a price target. Okay, number one, you don't just look at a price target and buy this stock because JP Morgan came out with a price target. You need to understand why um, that price target is, is, uh, is there and is what it is. Um, secondly, you have to see when JP Morgan actually came out to the price target and when he put it on Google Finance. Because JP Morgan doesn't give out anything for free. Um, he would have first sold the shares to his clients and then put it there for you to, to, to see. So you have to see exactly um, the reasoning behind, behind everything. We, like I said, do our own list, do our own price targets, and we distribute to our clients as soon as we come up with a price target. So uh, we don't just take what JP Morgan is saying, but we verify that what he's saying is correct and, and whether that price target makes sense for us. But if you go on the, on the website of the Financial Times, mm -hmm. you'd have 10, uh, 17 analysts giving their opinion. Exactly. Doesn't, doesn't that give even more weight to the valuations? Of course. Yeah. Yes, but again, that, that's just one part of the story. I mean, apart from that, you need to understand uh, how that price target came about. Okay, maybe. Maybe in his price market he's being too bullish, maybe. Don't, don't forget, uh, as well, and JP Morgan would have a lot of clients in, in, in a lot of stocks, so you, the, the tendency is to see price targets increase, not price targets. You tend to see a lot of buy recommendations, you don't see sell recommendations, okay? So you have to be careful there as well. Just make sure that what you're buying, um, the story behind it makes sense and the, the price target is reasonable with, uh, with the outlook of the industry as well and, uh, and the calculations made. The larger the company is, the more analysts will follow it. The smaller the company is, the greater the probability that the lower amount of analysts that will follow it. Um, but the greater the potential for higher returns because there will be less, like you said before, a lot of analysts following a company, that means that if all these analysts are following it, then the price would have moved closer to where it should be. The smaller the company is, um, the greater the potential, but the greater the risk because the less information there will be out there. I think uh, you need to have a mix of both. Just make sure that whatever you're buying, you have access to information, because if you don't have access to information, then you shouldn't be buying it. Okay, so uh, since there aren't any more questions, we can close off the seminar here. I hope uh, you all take something home with you and I hope that uh, you, you found this interesting. Just one more thing, uh, I'd like to, to mention, like I mentioned in, at the beginning, uh, in the coming weeks, we will be launching the UBS, officially the UBS, our UBS fund list and uh, further discounts will be given on, on uh, clients who, who actually go into these funds. Okay? Thank you.